From training to performing, join our Big League Conversation. Welcome to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast with your host, Eric Cressy. Welcome back to the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Cressy, and this is episode 67. Biomechanics are a hot topic in the baseball world as more and more technology has become available in the last few years. But today we're actually going to talk with someone who was there on the ground level when this started up back in the 1980s. So he's going to share some wisdom on how the field has evolved, where we are, and where we're headed. So I think we've got some really good stuff in line for not just our sports medicine professionals and our research nerds, but also really the players, the coaches, and the parents that can benefit from a lot of the outcomes that he's found in his research. So check it out. This episode is brought to you by Athletic Greens. It's an all-in-one superfood supplement with 75 whole food sourced ingredients to support your body's nutritional needs across five critical areas energy, immunity, gut health, hormonal support, and healthy aging. I'm an avid user of Athletic Greens myself in spite of the fact that I tend to be a supplement minimalist. To me, this is a product that is much more like whole food nutritional insurance as opposed to a true supplement. The ingredients have been carefully selected at the highest quality, most natural source. You get essential vitamins and minerals, digestive enzymes, prebiotics, probiotics, and that's the zero compromise approach from the company. It's plant-based, sourced from whole foods at the highest quality, so you won't find harmful chemicals, artificial colors or flavors, preservatives or added sugar. Um, Really, it's perfect for folks who are gluten and dairy free, paleo, keto, vegan friendly, um, great for people who are intermittent fasting, all that fun stuff. Um, Personally, I love it for for obviously our athletes who don't get enough nutritional uh, benefits from fruits and vegetables because they don't eat enough. So it's a way to kind of plug in holes in diets. But also I really like it for our college and professional athletes who may have complex travel schedules where quality food options aren't always at hand. Um, On a personal level, I'm a husband, father of three, and an entrepreneur. Um, We split our time between two states, and and I'm also still an avid lifter. Um, So life is inherently crazy, and it can be stressful, and sleep deprivation is definitely something that we encounter. So I rely on Athletic Greens um, for part of my immune support and believe firmly that it's it's made a big difference in keeping me healthy in spite of how crazy our lifestyle is. Um, They've got a great offer in place. If you head to athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, They'll get you 20 free travel packets with your purchase. Again, that's athleticgreens.com backslash Cressy, C-R-E-S-S-E-Y, and you can claim your special offer. Today's guest earned his engineering degrees from MIT, Washington University, and the University of Alabama, Birmingham. He's the research director of the American Sports Medicine Institute, where he's been since their inception in 1987. Much of the research at ASMI has focused on baseball pitching biomechanics, identifying mechanics for minimizing elbow and shoulder loads while maximizing ball velocity and accuracy. He and his team have analyzed thousands of baseball pitchers from youth level to major leaguers, providing individualized recommendations for safety and performance. He supervised 220 student researchers in biomechanical and medical models at ASMI and is also an adjunct professor in biomedical engineering at UAB. He has published 200 scientific articles, books, chapters, and books in collaboration with colleagues at ASMI and other institutions. He's also delivered 350 presentations throughout the world and has been featured widely in various media outlets. In addition, he works on policy and guidelines as chair of the USA Baseball Medical and Safety Advisory Committee, injury research advisor for Major League Baseball, and safety consultant for Little League Baseball. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Glenn Fleissig. Welcome to the show, Glenn. Thanks, Eric. I appreciate you coming on. I'm excited to, to tap into a, a wealth of knowledge and, and decades of, of experience in the, uh, the baseball biomechanics realm. So I'm curious, you were one of the first to come on the scene in the world of baseball biomechanics. So how did that originally come about? Was it something you always aspired to do or was it something you fell into by accident? Uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be uh... Uh, you know, the center fielder for the New York Mets growing up in New York or whatever. But uh, I was much better. Well, I was on the varsity math team, not the varsity <laughs> baseball team when I was in high school. So uh, I had to have a different career choice. And then uh, so I, I I personally, I went to MIT and uh, I majored in mechanical engineering. I was very good in that. And I figured, well, I'd have a career in mechanical engineering and I just watch baseball and play with my friends or whatever. 
But at, I was there for three and a half years at MIT, and as a senior, you have to um, pick a, a, a thesis project. And so and there are different mechanical engineering labs at MIT, and one was a biomechanics lab. This was 1983, and I didn't know – I never heard the word biomechanics. And it, biomechanics, which is my field, is a combination of biology and mechanics. It's, the, it's, the, it's how humans move. And uh, so I went in that lab. The other labs, mechanical engineering, they were – had welding things and mechanical properties of stuff. And I walk into this lab and they're analyzing a golf swing. And I'm like, okay, this is what I want to do. And again, this is the early 1980s. So, uh, I worked on the biomechanics of a golf swing as my, uh, master, as my bachelor's thesis project. And then I told the professor, Professor Mann, back in the 1980s, I said, I want to get a job doing this. And I, I remember this. This was 30, Five years ago, but I remember he laughed at me. He said, there are, no, there are no jobs doing this, Glenn. You can't get a job doing this. But he said, let me introduce you to um, someone at the Olympic Training Center, the U.S. Olympic Training Center. So I went in 1984 to Colorado Springs, and I uh, worked under Dr. Chuck Dillman, who was the director of the research there. And uh, we analyzed all sorts of athletes there. It was really exciting, Eric, because it was 1984. The Olympics were in the United States. They were in Los Angeles. So the world was watching us, and it was really exciting. And I learned the biomechan biomechanics of sports there, essentially how to analyze human emotion. Well, as I, I was doing well in my internship there, and as I'm finishing up, I saw, told Dr. Dillman uh, I want to get into baseball biomechanics, uh, combining uh, my love of baseball with uh, my engineering know-how. He said there's a young up-and-coming doctor, a guy named Dr. Jim Andrews, who lives in uh, Georgia, and he introduced him to me. And I spoke to Dr. Andrews in 1984, and uh, uh, we, we hit it off. He was young, I was young, and, uh, and he said, but he's not ready. And I'm like, okay. So I went on with my life, and in 1986, I'm at home having uh, Thanksgiving dinner with my mommy and daddy in New York and everything, and, uh, um, and my mom says, the phone call for you, and, and Handed to me, and it was a guy who works with Dr. Andrews. I hadn't spoken to this guy for over two years since our one phone call, and this was before the internet. I don't know if he kept my phone number on a piece of paper or, or what. I, I don't know. So um, he says, We're ready. I'm like, Oh, really? And so uh, I dropped what I was doing. I was getting my master's degree at the time, and I moved to Alabama. I, I pretty much could hardly know where Alabama was on the map at that point in my life, and I and the rest is history. We started uh, ASMI in 1987, and uh, he, uh, Dr. Andrews, said um, set, uh, he set up two companies: his medical practice and ASMI. And he told me that my purpose is to essentially put him out of business <laughs> to try to make sure people don't get hurt. And uh, we haven't failed. At, we failed at that. <laughs> people are still getting hurt, but I, I think we've been very successful. And let me just say, we were not the only people dabbling in baseball biomechanics at the time. Other pioneers were uh um there was a rob shapiro who was a, a biomechanics student in illinois and michael feltner who was a biomechanics student in indiana and they both did um uh, uh, projects phd projects on baseball early pioneers um in fact this guy dr chuck dillman he keeps coming back into the story because he was rob shapiro's advisor and then he later became my boss again at asmi so he was my boss twice in life um but dr andrews was really the uh the thing that dr andrews vision put this on the map <laughs> meanwhile on the field eric there were two pioneers who had taken off their uniform and were trying to dabble in biomechanics because in the 1980s the technology was just coming about it was video was coming versus film I know this is a uh, history, old time history lesson, but um, there were two guys who had hung up their playing uniforms and were starting to dabble in analyzing their mechanics. Uh, one was uh, Dr. Mike Marshall, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the longtime relief pitcher, even won a Cy Young Award. Mm -hmm. And the other one was uh, uh, Tom House. Mm -hmm. And these two guys were the uniform, well, you know, Tom House was a pitching coach yeah. for Nolan Ryan, et cetera. And they were the first ones to uh, really having had that field experience, trying to get the, the science on t into baseball. So I was doing it in the lab side, and they were doing it on the field side. And uh, and, and frankly, another uh, early player that made it come together is 
uh, when we started ASMI in Birmingham, Alabama, where we still are, uh, we set up a biomechanics lab, and we had the uh, pitching coach from the Birmingham Barons come by, which is a Chicago White Sox uh, mm-hmm. affiliate. Again, Chuck Dillman was here, and he had the White Sox connections. And um, and uh, the young pitching coach was this uh, young guy named Rick Peterson. <laughs> and, uh, and Rick, uh, uh, you know, it was his first gig as a pitching coach. And he actually, well, I don't remember the exact words, but he, he was not into, he didn't know what the heck we were doing. <laughs> he, had, he had played and just thought you throw. <laughs> and then, um, but he fell in love with what we were doing. And he, he asked so many questions. And uh, anyway, so it was very important because, frankly, Eric, when, uh, I, when we watch a baseball pitcher, I, the pitching coach might say, oh, look, his, uh, his foot landed open. And or his uh, his shoulders flew open, and the the doctor might look at it and say, "Oh, look at the stress on the rotator cuff," and I might look at it and say, "Oh, look at that angular velocity or that torque." <laughs> and really, we have to all speak the same language, and put this together. And so, that's the challenge and the beauty of biomechanics. It's it's getting this Isaac Newton physics on, into a, a, an athlete. About the study of biomechanics as it relates to baseball, how has it evolved over the years? What was it? What is it now? Um, both and actually, what you're you're looking for? Sure. Well, the technology is the exact same. We still use the exact same camera we used in 1987. No, I'm just kidding. Um, technology obviously has evolved a lot. Interesting story. When we started ASMI in 1986, 1987, it was so basic. Uh, it was just the transition from uh, film cameras to video cameras. But it was video cameras, and we were just starting to get from two-dimensional to three-dimensional. Two-dimensional analysis is a single camera, and you just see a side view of a person or a front view. You don't have the three-dimensional rotation. And as you know, you don't need a biomechanics degree to know people are moving three-dimensionally, not just in a plane. And uh, so it was very limited, and it was a big breakthrough right when we were started there. But uh, but what happened was the equipment was so expensive and limited what it could do in the ni- early 1980s. Then a funny thing happened. These companies that were trying to make this biomechanics equipment for Olympic athletes or walking or whatever, they had there were small companies um, trying to uh, make expensive co- equipment and had very few customers. We were one of them. And then what happened was Hollywood got involved and all these uh, – coming on the heels of Star Wars and Lucasfilm and other movies, all of a sudden the movie industry wanted better technology for uh, for making people who look like frogs run around or, or whatever. So the movie industry pumped all sorts of money into these companies that were making the motion capture equipment. And uh, the biomechanics science just went for the free ride. We were paying you know, $100,000 here or there, but the movie companies were paying a million dollars for the technology to be faster, better, more accurate. So, you know, computers can always get more accurate, but um, this was artificially accelerated, fortunately, by the in- entertainment industry, movies and also video games. And so all of a sudden, the equipment we were able to buy in the 90s was so much better, okay? And so what we were able to do was uh, analyze athletes much quicker and much more accurate. The, the resolution, if you said a guy bent his elbow... 35 degrees you were much more it was much more accurate it wasn't uh such a ballpark i guess so that's what happened and that's really been what's happening for 30 years that uh the gold standard continues to be uh, if you look at the asmi.org website and look at the biomechanical evaluation you'll see um an example of a baseball pitcher being tested and still the gold standard where a baseball pitcher comes to a biomechanics lab and you put these little silver reflective markers on their body. You might have seen it in a, on, at ASMI, or you might have seen it when they show how they make the video games or special effects in movies. It's still the gold standard for motion capture. That's uh, what we do still. But I'm really excited, Eric, that the uh, next technology is here now. The next technology is what we're going to call markerless motion mm-hmm. capture. And so... Uh, up to now, the cameras, multiple cameras, will collect a baseball pitcher, a baseball batter, or a, a other person with markers and say, okay, that, that dot was the elbow, that dot was the shoulder, 
that dot was uh, the knee and try to connect the dots. Uh, you want to connect your shoulder to your knee, but mm-hmm. uh, you know what I'm saying? Yep. Um, and nowadays, by making the computer smarter, the computer can look at the video from the different aspects, the different angles, and say, oh, that blob is an arm. That blob is a leg. I see that there's a, a light-colored thing in a, against a dark background or vice versa, and that's an arm or that's a leg, and without markers trying to capture it. This will... This is revolutionary, and this is there are some companies that are um, are doing this, and some companies are claiming to do it. Some companies are actually doing it, and it's uh, really exciting and really a challenge. the The benefits are obvious. The benefits are you could uh, collect data of athletes, baseball players, actually in games, because as far as I know, you don't wear little silver reflective markers on your body when you play in the World Series. So. Uh, um, if we could just have special cameras collecting actual athletes in games, it's uh, it, it's it's the it's the elite data. Mm-hmm. Um, the other advantage is the smarter we make the computer, the less smart the operator needs to be. If the, if the computer is uh, figuring out where the lateral epicondyle is or or whatever body landmark are, then uh, you don't need a technician putting reflective markers on exact spots on the body. So where we're at is if uh yeah, not to interrupt, but I'm curious. Do you do you think that's that's a blessing and a burden sometimes? Where you know if if the technician doesn't necessarily have to be as skilled, does that does that open the whole industry up to a, a lower barrier to entry, right? More people can do it, so more people can you know effectively create research quickly that may or may not be accurate, well informed, you know, it may be misdirected. Has that been your experience or do you feel it's you know it's it's not something that's gone that direction? I, I think the uh, where we're going to be able to get rid of the markers is not a blessing and a curse. It's just a blessing. Okay. okay good. The uh, the ability to collect data without having to have a special skills in, in knowing bony landmarks is just a blessing. It's going to make ba- baseball biomechanics available to all. The uh, the curse is about the information that's mm-hmm. coming out of it. You know, the, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and. Uh, uh, well, kind of what you're getting at there, Eric, is if uh, a lot of people have access to this type of information, people will misinterpret it. And that is totally, I'm trying to put words in your mouth, but that is totally true. And that's totally the challenge. In fact, these companies that are coming out with their re- markerless motion capture, they have very impressive technologies. And so the qu- first question is, how accurate is it? And as they're passing the test, the next question is, what the hell do you do with all this data we collect, okay? And so whether it's uh, your employer, the New York Yankees, or whether it's uh, the local high school down the street or some uh, minor leaguer pitcher who has an instructional center, um, uh, when you collect all this data, what are you going to do with it? And, and in Major League Baseball, we've already seen this issue. Um, this issue, uh, this technology in Major League Baseball and Minor League Baseball such as the the ball tracking software, which has evolved from a, it's been PitchFX and TrackMan and Hawkeye, and these different companies, but they're, they're tracking not just ball velocity, but now how much did the ball break and spin and all these things and launch angle for batting. And there's an overwhelming amount of data. And, uh, and then you need to know what to do with it. Well, we're opening the box much bigger. If, if you not only know the baseball pitcher's um, spin rate of his of his curveball, but now you know his elbow angle and his hip rotational velocity. It's an overwhelming amount of data. So what I was getting at is these technology companies are coming to us and saying, "Hey, we have a great technology. We have hungry customers, whether the pro teams or college teams or whatever. But uh, what do we do with all this?" So so places like mine, American Sports Medicine Institute, um, we are. Uh, involved with some companies. In fact, we just uh, uh, formed a relationship with one of these companies called uh, Dari Motion, D-A-R-I mm-hmm. Motion. And um, so we are going to partner with various companies, uh, not just one. We're trying to various companies where they could sell or whatever their equipment to teams, but then we want to put some kind of uh, Glenn Fleissig or ASMI uh, brain in the system to help interpret what happens. Um, and, and that's why... Uh, with the with now the new technology, what's happening now is uh, 
biomechanics is getting more accepted in baseball, both at the pro level and amateur level. And um, so we're forming a new society uh, called the American Baseball Biomechanics Society. I think you're going to put up a, a link yeah. or something yeah, like we'll, that. Yeah, we'll spread the word for sure. Uh, so American Baseball Biomechanics Society, just like other professions, is a is a society. It's a new society of all the experts, the scientists um, from universities and teams and everything. And uh, we're actually having our first virtual conference. If you go to our website, uh, baseballbiomechanics.org, you can see in a couple of weeks we have uh, uh, our first virtual conference where we're going to go over some of the topics about what equipment is out there and and how to analyze uh, different athletes, different baseball players. That's awesome. All right, so research at ASMI has has covered tons of ground. I mean, obviously, there's stuff that's been on the you know surgical side of things, the rehabilitation side of things, and in your realm of biomechanics. So I'm, I'm curious when you look back at the studies you've done um, over the course of, of time, what what do you see as the most impactful of them? What do you think made the biggest difference, or the most compelling ones that our listeners would be wise to go back and, and read up on? Sure, sure. Well. As I told you in my little story before, my background is biomechanics. But uh, ironically, uh, the, the biggest impact we've done is not biomechanics. It's more about pitch count and overuse. And so um, when a baseball player, we, we have more injuries now than ever before. And, you know, what are we doing? I mean, if we're doing science and injuries are going up, we must we're fighting against something. And um, and, and what we're fighting against is there's been a change in society. So um, pitchers today, there are more injuries, but there are a few factors for why a pitcher gets hurt, uh, just focusing on pitchers. Uh, one is uh, his mechanics. Uh, another one is how often he throws. And another one is how much, how forceful or the intensity of his throw. And so while we have put more information, and I believe pitching mechanics are better now than ever before, due to the science showing coaches how it should be done. The other factors are working against us. The other factors are uh, are uh, the overuse and the intensity. And the intensity has to do with uh, the radar gun and the love of speed. And, and the truth is, I'm going to just mention something really quickly about that, that everyone, a lot of people think the faster you throw, the better the pitcher you are. And our science does not show that. And we're I'm really banging my head against the wall on this one without many people listening, but hopefully some people here will listen. We've, we've done some research that has shown that the best major league pitchers does not equal the fastest major league pitchers. And you can think about any team. Um, uh, there's a variety. There's some fast, fast pitching pitchers who are good, but there's some who are not as good as they should be. And, and likewise, there's some guys with a little lesser speed who uh, have better performance. And, but, in the biomechanics lab, we've shown that the pitchers who max out, who throw all pitchers a full effort, whether it's pros or lower level pitchers, amateurs, the pitcher who is always redlining, who is always throwing as hard as possible, uh, first of all, again, he's not the one who has the best performance because pitching is about fooling the timing of the batters, mm-hmm. but he also has the highest risk of injury. So if there is some guy who just has one speed, 100%, or or 11, as they say in the spinal tap, um, he really, his, his uh, success is probably going to be as a one-inning reliever, uh, not as a starting pitcher. But the starting pitchers who succeed, I've spoken to a lot of Hall of Famers and other pitchers I've known along the way, and they know when to have that extra gear, and and, and they, they, it's more of an endurance thing. And, and so, um, moving on past that, um, you can't always max out. That's not, that's not, that's throwing. That's not pitching. Okay. But the, the biggest impact to answer your question has been our pitch count uh, research. We've done biomechanics work that's shown some relationship between biomechanics getting hurt, but our pitch count has a, a direct correlation. In fact, the one, um, the one project we've ever done in our 30 plus years with the highest scientific, uh, significance has been a uh, fatigue study that we showed pitchers, amateur pitchers, high school pitchers, who uh, routinely kept pitching when they were fatigued compared to pitchers who stopped pitching when they were fatigued. Uh, the ones who pitched when they were fatigued 
they were the ones who ended up having surgery. It was it was almost all or nothing. It didn't matter if they threw curveballs or or mechanics. It was uh, if you keep pitching when you're fatigued and don't listen to your body, you will end up having surgery. If you are fatigued and your pitching coach yanks you or 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 somehow you come out, you are, are you're the ones who are going to survive. Um, so what we've done also 10, 15 years ago with Little League and USA Baseball and other groups, we um, started counting pitch counts uh, because up until this past generation, all amateur baseball, Little League and other leagues were limiting innings, not pitches. Okay, uh, You could pitch seven innings in game or five innings or whatever. But now uh, our science has shown that it should be 75 pitches or 85 pitches or whatever. And Eric, this has been the best thing. The most impactful thing, because the science was so, so such strong proof, and then uh, we've made changes um, through my work with USA Baseball and and Major League Baseball. Uh, one more website to throw at you is uh, PitchSmart.org. Absolutely. This was a, uh, uh, as you know, this was a, a collaboration between Major League Baseball and uh, USA Baseball, uh, trying to make all amateur baseball safer. And it, and this has been the biggest effect we've had. Uh, it's changed. It's changed amateur baseball from uh, from the, the smallest leagues uh, through college level. Uh, leagues are moving to pitch count limits. Interestingly, then the next question is why doesn't Major League Baseball have such a thing? Well, Major League Baseball and amateur baseball are two different animals, as you know from your yeah. life. In um, Major League Baseball, you have the best athletes. You also have Major and minor league baseball, let's say pro baseball. You have the best athletes. You also have the best coaches. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, they are professional coaches. And they are on the lookout for pitchers who are fatigued, Mm -hmm. pitchers who are ineffective and are taking them out. Um, In amateur baseball, you also have amateur coaches. You have someone's Mm -hmm. dad or or whatever. And um, and so the intention of the message is different. As I said, fatigue is the biggest factor we've ever proven. And Mm -hmm. If I can make one rule in baseball, I would say when you're fatigued, stop pitching. Yeah, that was that would be it. It, it would come for different times for different people. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we but amateur baseball you can't do that because oh he's my best pitcher oh he feels fine blah 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 mm-hmm. and so uh, we have to set some pitch count limits. The truth is between me and you and your audience, when we set a limit, that limit is undoubtedly too strict for one kid and is mm-hmm. too loose for some other kid. But we can't have individual limits. We have the average limit that works yeah. for most people. But it's like seatbelts, right? You 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 give seatbelts. Yes. Some people drive fast. Some people drive slow. But they they protect right. everybody. <laughs> exactly. Now in the pro level, mm-hmm. we don't have pitch count limits, and I would say we do not want them or need them because you have the best coaches. Mm-hmm. Your your coaches are saying, hey, he he has good mechanics or he's strong. Or I spoke to the trainer, he could go. Yep. Or you could say, uh, he's been struggling. Let's. Let's uh, shut him down earlier, uh, have a lower limit. So it's totally fine. The pro level, they are, needless to say, they're conscious of pitch counts. And so it's fine. At the amateur level, we have to set limits because even with the best intentions, um, um, they, they need some help, some another, guidance. Another, another really important point in there is, you know, when we do the pro versus amateur comparison, there's an element of survivorship bias there. There's a reason that they're professional athletes. They survive the amateur ranks, right? In many cases, that yes. may be because they, they understood how to take care of their body better, whether it was arm care or soft tissue work or flexibility initiatives or, or they had, you know, pristine mechanics that, uh, you know, basically uh, shared stress across multiple joints as opposed to just selling out for crazy amount of, of valgus stress at an elbow. So I think, you know, we look at pro guys, it's not always the best thing that we can compare to on the, on the, the younger side. Um, no, I thought there's a Definitely. lot, of, a lot of dollars and cents involved at that, that higher level that, that doesn't need to be a consideration at the younger levels when we're just trying to let kids have fun and develop. Um, Definitely. So I, Definitely I think that's it. And I, I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to throw a, like an exclamation point on that. So you have 118 studies published on Medline with your name on it. And, you basically went right to don't pitch with fatigue as your most important message that you could convey to a large audience. And I, I think that's a very compelling thing that we should, we should reemphasize is that you could have gone in the direction of surgical initiatives, 
Um, you know, you could have gone in the, the direction of, you know, specific sure. mechanical impacts or, you know, anything, you know, that, that else that you've done and you chose that. And I think that's a, a, a very, very commendable thing to do. And I, I think it speaks to what you guys are trying to accomplish. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. And, and you know, I want to say again, my heart and my brain are into mechanics and biomechanics, but that's not where I went when I answered your question, because, yeah. uh, although I love that and it, it's proven some relationship, this pitch count limit. Uh, has proven to be the most effective way to uh, avoid injuries. Yeah. And that's and you, actually this is maybe a, a pivot pivot on this question. But so that's a, that's an acute look, right? So you're you're in the seventh inning, you're exhausted, don't throw anymore. So that's a, a more of a transient measure of fatigue. Let's talk about kind of the more of the chronic fatigue. Um, you know, certainly there was a yeah. there's a really good study from Olson, you know, that looked at a lot of factors, everything from number of innings pitched per year to showcase appearances, things like that. What have you seen more on the chronic side of things? Are there general recommendations that you like to make for athletes in terms of maybe planning out their competitive sure. calendar over the course of a year? What do you like to see? Sure. sure. Um, so, yeah, you're right. Overuse uh, is acute and is chronic, meaning uh, how many pitches did you pitch today? What's, how many, what's your pitch count today? And also how much did you do over the course of the year or the season? That Olson article you referred to, what we concluded was uh, um, the pitchers who take four months off from competitive pitching per calendar year uh, – uh, ideally, at least two or three of those months consecutive, uh, they have a much lower chance of uh, getting hurt. I believe it was three times less chance of getting hurt or three or five times less chance of getting hurt if they took a few months off versus playing year-round. Um, uh, so the other thing is uh, we we did a, a study, a 10-year study, which I'm really proud of. Um, I, I, think, I think I'm the lead author. Maybe you could help me. I could uh, look it up, but we did... We did a 10-year study following these, uh, you know, 10-year-olds, and we watched them for like 10 years to see who en- ended up having surgery. And what we found out was that uh, the amateur pitcher who pitches more than 100 innings per year are the ones who end up uh, blowing out, basically quitting baseball from injury or having surgery. And uh, and it really worked out very nicely and conveniently that it ended up being 100 innings per year, such a, a nice round number yeah. to look at. Um but it, it, it showed up statistically very strong. So uh, there's proof. If you if the amateur pitcher, um, on average, le- pitches less than 100 innings in competition per year, or pitching over 100 innings per year greatly increases the chance that he's going to become a close personal friend to Dr. Andrews or one of the other uh, surgeons. So uh, um, to avoid surgery or, or burning out of baseball from injury, um, you certainly don't want to go over 100 innings in a calendar year. And the thing is, when I was a kid, we had Little League, and then we had, in the fall, we had football and we had basketball. But nowadays, people specialize in one sport, whether yep. it's baseball or whatever. And, and as you go around a uh, Yankee camp where you work or other camps, a lot of the uh, pro baseball players were the best athletes growing up. Not the best baseball players only. They were the best athletes. They played multiple sports as kids. And uh, I know you're all about strength and conditioning and um, knowing your body. And, and uh, really, I don't think at any level you want to make a baseball pitcher. You want to make an athlete who pitches or an athlete who bats. And uh, wouldn't you say that that, uh, that is a uh, record for su- the recipe for success? Uh, would you agree with me? Absolutely. If I may ask you a question. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think, you know, w- one thing that and we've touched on it on previous podcasts is just that when I look around a room full of major leaguers, you know, and, I, and I've done polls on this at our, at our training facility in the off season, it's, it's absolutely like awe inspiring how few of them were actually even like you know, like amazing high school prospects. Yes, most of them were like the best player in their town or something like that. But the number of big leaguers you see that that didn't yeah. go to the college they wanted to, or they went to college and they they realized, holy cow, this is hard. The number of guys who got cut from, you know, making the area code roster. I mean, I always remember when we were with USA Baseball selecting the eighteen and under, you know, national team rosters. There's you know right. the, the last eight kids that are cut, and and one of the things that our our head coach Glenn Chikini said in front of the room, he's like, hey, remember we we cut Mike Trout in this room. You know, he's the best player <laughs> in history. He didn't make this roster when he was in high school, and right. you know, it's just. It's, there's something to be said about, you know, late bloomers. I'm not saying that, you know, that's every successful athlete, but there are a lot that really figure it out in that, 
18 to 22 range, and we see the success of college draft picks compared to high school draft picks. There's there's a lot that happens in that time period. So I just I don't think we can overstate enough to parents that if you use up, you know, all those bullets and and you 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 push risk too much in the you know the 12 to 16 year old age ranges. Right. It's just not worth it. You're you're so much better off like being a little bit better every day than having those setbacks where you miss six months of development. Because you know, I even look at you know what we're dealing with now. Like you know, it's interesting as people talk about you know everything that's going on in the world. Like one of the things that you know I think more and more people are speaking about is like you know the kids that are missing you know potentially a full year of school between shutting down in the spring and turning up in the fall. And I have I have twin five and a half year old daughters, and you know I think about developmentally what happens to them just in terms of like you know learning at home versus learning at school you know for a while there was no like playground access so we were trying to do as much as we could at home and it's just those are those are really crucial developmental windows six months is a really long time before the age of 18 whereas you know people are a little bit more they are who they are you know once we get well into our 20s but we need to give these these kids a chance to develop by by not having setbacks you know i want to say uh, uh just one more thing about this overuse thing and i can't emphasize it enough even though my background is biomechanics uh, this generation, we did not invent, invent the enthusiastic baseball player, and we did not invent the enthusiastic parent, okay? Yeah. So why are there more injuries now than uh, 20 or 40 years ago? Again, there was enthusiastic parents back then, but there was no opportunity to play one sport year-round. And so uh, it's not that the enthusiasm is new, but the, uh, the venues, the, the travel teams, the, uh, the showcases, these are the new things. So... Uh, uh, some of it is not good. Some of the opportunities, more is not always better. So I, I actually uh, think what we should do is a, a scientific experiment. I've done plenty of experiments proving that if you play year-round or pitch too much, you can get hurt. I want to do the Cressy study where we put one of your twin so- daughters <laughs> in a year-round program and one of your twin daughters not, and we'll see uh, who gets hurt. Are, are um, you up for that? I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> the problem is I have one that follows instructions and the other one that is on her own program. So that's challenging. Yeah. I'll say this. If I ever do a study, I want to do a study of older and younger brothers. I, I have never seen the, the actual numbers, but if you look at big leaguers, I think we would see a, a crazy number of younger brothers. And, and what is, what happens when you're a younger brother, you compete against your, your older brothers yes. um, and all of yes. his friends. And you just, you kind of get your butt kicked. But what it is, is it, if you really think about it, it's a, it's a complete separation from early sports specialization. Cause you, you know, you're doing whatever you're told to do by your older brothers. Very rarely is it the same thing all the time. So that's, yeah. that's my study. I've had some good conversations with a lot of guys about it. Um, so yeah. we're, we're gonna... it's, 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 I just want to say it's before my time, but uh, <laughs> over here in Birmingham, they used to have a Negro League baseball, of mm-hmm. course, back in the day before I, I was born in. And uh, they had a 15-year-old center fielder who was quite good at, at the Birmingham um, Birmingham Black Barons. His name was Willie Mays. Wow. And I think it worked out uh, pretty well for him. You're not but... kidding. So, all right, so yes. we're going to pivot a little bit. Um, anytime you produce a lot of quality research – some of it's going to be misinterpreted, right? I, I, I have one published study to my name from my master's thesis, and that's been misinterpreted. So do you have an example of when something you put out there was taken completely out of context or misinterpreted? Yes. Here's your chance to set the record straight on something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm uh, sorry you're 0 for 1 there. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was compelling, but as always, people like to argue on the internet, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I don't think... I don't think our research I'm about to say was misinterpreted. I think it was interpreted the way the person wanted it to interpret it. And I, I think of politics right now that a Republican or a Democrat, there's a piece of fact, whether it's around coronavirus or voting patterns or whatever. And um, it's a fact, but then they spin it the way they want it to. And, and uh, not to get political, but I think that's what's happened with uh, a couple of our research studies. In particular, we did research looking at uh, the effect of uh, long toss compared to pitching. Yep. And more recently, we've done some research compa- uh, of weighted baseballs, training with weighted baseballs compared to pitching. And none of our research says weighted baseballs is good or weighted baseballs is bad. It says when you throw weighted baseballs, this is what happens to your body and your arm. And so, uh, for instance, um, for instance, in the long toss, our studies have shown that when you throw, uh, you know, 60 feet, six inches is pitching distance. But when you throw on flat ground, 60 feet, 100 feet, 120 feet, you can maintain pretty similar forces and motions to pitching. But when you 
throw maximum distance, particularly when you throw on a big high rainbow arc versus straight, the uh, the uh, external rotation of the shoulder and the forces on the shoulder and elbow are actually greater in that long toss than in pitching. And similar, and, and and so, um, someone a proponent of long toss will say, "Look, this is a great exercise. That ASMI study has proven long toss is good. It builds up your arm strength by applying, uh, allowing you to produce more force and torque at your elbow and shoulder." And and someone who's against long toss will say, "Look, you shouldn't long toss because it's dangerous. ASMI study showed it's more forceful." So uh, again, and then the weighted ball is similar. We've done some studies. And I'll tell you what we found in the biomechanics lab. We found that when you train with weighted baseballs, as you know, a baseball is five ounces. So I'm talking about training with overweight and underweight baseballs. What we found is that uh, when you train with uh, varied weight baseballs, you actually can uh, generate more shoulder external rotation and how far back you crank your arm. And you can also generate more ball velocity. But you also... Uh, increase your risk of injury. Mm-hmm. So um, these studies will show that in this case, oh, ASMI studies, we have two, and we had a, a one that just came out. We have three, actually. Um, shows that, oh, weighted baseballs are good because it improves your ball velocity. And it also improves your shoulder external rotation, which is linked to ball velocity. On the other hand, people will say the studies prove that weighted balls are bad because it increases the risk of injury, which it does. And it artificially essentially stretches out your shoulder too much, which it does. So uh, I think our studies, not that they've been misinterpreted. I think people have been, they've been interpreted the way the person wants to interpret it. I, I definitely can see that. Um, so let's talk about biomechanics now, how it's impacting the way baseball is played today, um, both in the lab and then, you know, actually on the field with, you know, in-game assessments and things like that. Sure, sure. So there's professional market and there's the amateur market. And uh, from the amateur market, there are biomechanics labs like ours at ASMI and Driveline and other places that are giving pitching instruction with based on uh, biomechanics, based on biomechanics principles plus individual evaluations. This has been happening for several years, and I think it's great. Uh, it's great. Now, uh, but not everyone can afford the time and the money to get into a biomechanics lab. And so in the last few years, there have been, a, uh, you know, less expensive things like wearable technologies, mm-hmm. like this thing called the Modus sleeve, M-O-T-U-S. And it, it's a, what's called an IMU. You put it on your elbow in a sleeve, and it can measure how much torque or force there is on your arm and can do assess various things. So there's some wearable things that are $100, $200. They have these uh, sensors you could put on your baseball bat that can measure your, your bat speed and things like that. So – biomechanics is getting into the hand of the consumer, which is great, which is great. Uh, like we said before, you had to worry about interpretation and misinterpretation. But at the pro level, I'm very excited that, you know, uh, uh, 15 years ago, uh, Moneyball or whatever the time frame is, Moneyball came out and people started looking at different ways to get a competitive advantage. And let's, instead of just looking at batting averages, for instance, let's look at on-base percentage and let's look at things a different way. Um, you know, we've all read the book, seen the movie, etc. This is, I think, the next money ball. This is the next uh, competitive advantage in baseball. And uh, I'm involved with many major league teams, and uh, some teams more than others have embraced uh, biomechanics and are trying to use it to advantage. Some teams are buying biomechanic systems. Some teams are hiring biomechanists. And essentially, if you have uh, two baseball batters, <clears throat> two baseball batters and uh they could their 40 yard dash is the same and they could bench press the same amount of weight uh how come one of them can hit the ball farther or has a higher batting average or 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 pitchers how come two guys um how come one guy is a better pitcher than the other can last uh, eight innings and the other guy can last five innings so teams are now investing into buying the biomechanics equipment and the biomechanics personnel to uh, try to give their players the advantage for for both safety but also for performance. I love it. All right, so what's the next frontier? You kind of hinted at it. What would you like to yeah. see? What would you like to be able to measure but you, you can't currently measure? Yeah, yeah. So, again, I think that the next frontier is kind of standardization. Uh, 
so again with this uh, American Baseball Biomechanics Society, all at least all the biomechanists need to be speaking the same language. When we say torque or we say moment, which are two terms that are the same, uh, are we, which are we saying, and uh, how do we translate that to, to teams, and and which equipment is accurate, and how fast is it right is the right arm velocity? So uh, I'm looking for a standardization. You know, what, what was the other part of your question? Um, that you would love to be able to measure, but you we just don't have the technology available for it just yet. Yeah. So okay, I, I guess to answer uh, the other question. Um, Again, what I want, what I want to be able to get out is, uh, in-game biomechanics. And some companies are, uh, moving in that direction and are selling their products. And so I think that's really what I want to be able to get out. That's where I see the future is getting in-game biomechanics. Um, you know, right now, uh, to see if, uh, um, you know, ultimately there, you can even make in-game adjustments. Like right now, when does a pitcher come out? A pitcher comes out, when he's starting to get lit up, but also they look at the radar gun. The, the, the radar gun speed is up on the board. It says, uh, it says his velocity has dropped from 90 to 85 and, and, and the pitching coach can see that or whoever. But, um, ultimately uh, uh, they might be able to see that, Oh, look, his, his arm is dropping when he pitches now. Um, his, his arm used to be a 90 degree shoulder pit uh, arm pit angle. Uh, but now it's 85 degrees. He's dropping his arm. Maybe it's time to get him out. He's getting fatigued. Um, likewise, uh, teams may be ad- able to adjust in the future. Uh, and, and again, so this is a, a challenge is both uh, technically and, and, uh, and ethically about, uh, uh, obviously last season we had a lot of things about ethics and technology and baseball, but, um, right now baseball is, does not allow teams to use the technology to make uh, live adjustments. Mm-hmm. Like uh, you can't, uh, th- you can't watch a technology and see, oh, his arm slot is this, and then signal to the batter that his arm slot is lower or higher. But uh, you, with the delay, you can look at the data. Oh, last inning, his curveballs, his arm slot was lower. He bent his knee more. So uh, in the future, uh, the Technology might be used for in-game adjustment, but I, I'm more interested in in the player's adjustment. In other words, not in-game, but if a player says, "Hey, how come my uh, curveballs aren't breaking as much this year as last year?" Let's go look at the data, and I say, "Oh, I'm standing with my trunk more upright this year than last year, or mm-hmm. I'm not rotating my pelvis as much." So I'm more looking at how it could help players um, tune in their mechanics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in re- in real time too. That's that's the key. To well, it. it's, it's not good enough just to get the data three days later. Well, yeah, exactly. I think people are interested in that real time thing, but I think I'm more interested in that three days later thing. I'm more interested in um, on the bullpen sessions and working on you know uh, the last few starts. You haven't been getting the arm angular velocity or or your your pelvis has or whatever. So let us work on this. I'm more interested in that for keeping the players optimal. I'm curious to get your take on like Kinetrax, the SIMI system. Both of those are, are in-game biomechanics uh, assessments. Um, are there holes in those technologies or are they, they trending in the right direction in your opinion? Well, uh, that's exactly uh, one of the reasons. Uh, just to restate your question, you're asking why, uh, what, what do we think about these uh, technologies that are now selling to these uh, teams? Uh, and you named a couple of the brands. Um, that's exactly one of the reasons why we set up the American Baseball Biomechanics Society um, to answer these questions. Uh, again, the gold standard is still the marker system. So the test for um, these marker list systems is kind of a side by side comparison. And frankly, when I saw when I ran and saw some side by side comparison, perhaps five years ago, I was very unimpressed and kind of depressed that uh, it wasn't as good as I wanted it to be. Uh, I don't have. You know, I mean, as a scientist, I wanted it all to work. But on the other hand, I've been very pleasantly surprised and impressed by how accurate they seem to be now. I don't know. They kind of stepped up their game. <coughs> Sorry. But um, um, again, I'm not going to uh, endorse one company or the other. But I'm just saying that um, when the companies have shown me and put their mouth, put their money where their mouth is and let me see their equipment versus a marker system uh i'm impressed that it does seem to be taken off it does seem to be working um 
So again, this American Baseball Biomechanics Society is really set up for the baseball biomechanics people, the, the biomechanists. Um, but uh, frankly, it's also for um, the teams and, and doctors and stuff to uh, be able to count on us for uh, both things like uh, how good is this equipment? Well, maybe we could ask the American Baseball Biomechanics Society yeah. or I want to hire a biomechanist. Well, maybe you should hire someone who's a member of the society or, or uh, has been um, with the program in ABBS here. Um, so, uh, again, the, uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to ABBS, is the shorthand we're saying, mm-hmm. um, for us to get together as biomechanists and, and exchanging thoughts, mm-hmm. uh, as you do in, in your profession, like strength and conditioning and other uh, other groups have their professional societies where they get together and exchange information. But I'm also looking for us to be tapped for either people who want to hire a biomechanist mm-hmm. or want a consultation or want to know what the latest thing is. So um, I think the time is right, and uh, uh, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for it, and, and so that's what's happening there. That's great stuff. And so folks can learn more about it. It's baseballbiomechanics.org. Um, you guys are on Instagram. It's biomech underscore baseball. And on Twitter, it is, uh, excuse me, biomech underscore baseball as well. So lots of good options. And then folks can learn a little bit more where you are. It's ASMI underscore info on Twitter. And they, they publish all kinds of good stuff about events, latest research, stuff like that. And, um, just a, a wealth of information out there if people are willing to just take the time. And, and one more shout out to pitchmart.org is a, is a resource you mentioned that we use every single week. I can't tell you how many times I, I send that to parents day in and day out. Um, you know, as, as just a reference mark for, for taking care of their kids and, and making sure that you're advocates for them on the, the overuse front. So, um, really, really good stuff, Glenn. Thank you very much for joining us. I, uh, I picked up some good stuff today and I'm, and I'm sure our audience did as well. I want I wanted to say, thanks, Eric. I wanted to say a couple, uh, closing, uh, comments here that, um, I enjoyed, uh, doing this with you. And, and uh, of course I always enjoy doing things with you, but, um, our, our institute, ASMI.org, we don't have an ulterior agenda here or whatever. We're not trying to sell something or whatever. We're really just trying to make baseball better. Um, a couple of other things I want to say is, um, uh, we're all, we're all talking about the safety, 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 but I want to point out safety and performance go together. Mm-hmm. First of all, the, the guy who's having arm surgery, I don't care what his velocity was. His velocity is zero miles per hour right now. If he's having surgery. Okay. So, um, having a good biomechanics and good pitch counts and everything like that, it's uh, not just about safety. It's also making you have the best performance you could. The other thing is, um, a couple other things I want to just uh, throw on my laundry list here is we're all talking about the safety, safety, safety and, uh, and the overuse injuries at the high school level or whatever. But that's a, that's a big problem, but it's a less common problem than the other side of the spectrum, which is, uh, there are too many kids in America who are shut out from sports and not playing sports and just, sitting around being fat and lazy, uh, if I could just say crudely. And so, again, back when I grew up, um, it was a world where everyone played a little amateur sports. And now we have a situation where a few people play a lot of amateur sports and a lot of people play none. And so we really need to get people out in the field. So while we're trying to avoid the overuse of the elite athlete at all levels, we also want to encourage uh, everyone to be physically fit for their own benefit. And the last thing I want to point out is, as you know, um, ASMI has an annual injuries in baseball course. And, and, and uh, I, I think it's the highlight of our year every year, every January, every January before spring training uh, for pros, we have uh, a get together. And I really like this because as a biomechanist, I am telling what's the latest biomechanics information to the surgeons. And the surgeons are showing how they do the UCL repair or the surgery and the physical therapists are watching that. And the physical therapists are, are t- telling things to the strength and conditioning coach. And, um, and so it's not a surgery conference and it's not a biomechanics conference or a strength and conditioning. It's a baseball conference and it puts all the things together because our athletes, whether it's your, whether it's your son or your pro baseball player, they are not a biomechanics problem and they're not a surgery problem. They are a person. And so looking at the different sciences together, I think that's really the, uh, the best thing. That's great stuff. Well, again, you're the man. We appreciate you joining us. Picked up some really good stuff. So hope we'll be in touch again soon. 
My pleasure, Eric. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the CSP Elite Baseball Development Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd be thrilled if you'd consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review to read on iTunes. We welcome your suggestions for future guests and questions. Just email EliteBaseballPodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for your continued support, and we'll see you next episode.